Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Ryan Kazemi, your host for today's episode uh, on Complex Case Discussion Series. Uh, this is our sixth episode of this series, and we've had a lot of great feedback from, uh, from uh, folks, and uh, we continue to um, enjoy doing these programs. So thank you for everybody who is joining us online. Um, today we have a great, great, a very complex case to share with you. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to the, the conversation with, uh, with all of you. So uh, let me first uh, introduce my uh, dear friend and panelist, Dr. Mitch Lamke. Welcome. <laughs> Thank How you. are you? Thank you, Hamid. Um, and thank you for being here. Uh, so the patient that we're going to talk about today is a patient that we mutually treated. Yes. And uh, we hope to uh, provide everyone with an insight behind a, what, what I call a 20-year-old journey. A twisted journey. A uh, twisted journey. <laughs> uh, but a happy ending. In that Very. Sense. That's the most um, important thing. First of all, let me introduce uh, Mitch. Uh, we've known each other for a few years. Uh, Mitch is a, a restorative dentist, general practitioner and only uh, graduate of uh, University of Maryland. Uh, he has uh, uh, practiced for over 41 years. Uh, you've been very involved in, in uh, with the Academy of Laser Dentistry. Yes. You have achieved your uh, mastership in dental uh, laser technology. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. Uh, and you have uh, been active in clinical practice, teaching, uh, and, uh, and now we get to do this together. So it's really awesome. Welcome. Um, and also, also recently, your, your son, uh, Josh Lamke, joined you in practice. Yes. And that must be an amazing experience. It, it, it continues to be amazing. It's ongoing. Yeah. So, um, and, and the, the smile design of Olney is where you guys yes. uh, do your magic every day. Yes. I wanted to awesome. Yeah, I wanted to comment. I wanted to thank you so much for the privilege of, of allowing me to present this case with you to the members of our study club. It's always a joy to work with you. A truly a joy. We thank seem to you. push each other to the next level with each case we undertake. I believe that positive push makes both of us more effective clinicians. Uh, most important, we work as a team in the patient's best interest. Our inter interdisciplinary team on this case included Dr. Jill Bailey, who performed the patient's orthodontic care, which was really key to this case. That's right. So we'll talk about uh, how it was really a multidisciplinary uh, case involving surgical discipline, restorative, as well as orthodontics, and our thanks to Dr. Bailey uh, who's not here, but he, uh, she was an uh, effective member of this team. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's start the, the story. Journey. The twisted journey. Let's talk about the journey. All right. So um, again, uh, uh, Mitch Lumkey and uh, Dr. Jill Bailey were the, uh, the team uh, doctors along with myself. Uh, so let me tell you about the history of this patient. This was a patient that um, Mitch had been, have known for a long time, uh, who referred the patient to me. The uh, patient had several dental implants in the upper anterior. Her chief complaint was uh, chronic pain, discomfort around these restorations mm -hmm. and implants. Uh, and in spite of the hygiene care and the professional care that Mitch was providing, uh, it seemed to um, persist, and eventually um, uh, Mitch asked me to take a look and really discuss what is happening, what are some of the treatment options. So this is how uh, the patient came in, um, upper anterior bridge supported by several implants. Uh, we can see that uh, there was uh, some bone loss around the implants, and there was uh, peri-implantitis that had been probably in progress for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, here's the x-ray, the Panorex, which really kind of showed five uh, adjacent implants. Uh, there are some plates and screws from a previous ortho, uh, orthognathic procedure yes. that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and the, the, the cone beam CT scan, which is really a uh, essential diagnostic imaging anytime we look at uh, patients with implants, especially pre-implantitis, kind of demonstrated that there was a, a significant area of bone loss and deficient um, tissue on the, on the labial aspect uh, of the implants, which certainly made sense. When you talk about adverse 
imp crown to implant ratio, this is the epitome of it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I'm going to kind of dial it back a little bit uh, about this patient about 20 years earlier. So I'm going to turn to uh, Mitch to give us a little bit of a background because you've known the patient from uh, adolescence. Yeah, so years. Th thank you, Amit. So, so what happened with this patient from the get-go? Well, in, in 2001, the patient was about 15 years old when she was first referred to me. Uh, at that time, she was undergoing orthodontic treatment to realign her dentition uh, post-traumatic sports injury, specifically mm -hmm. a soccer ball and or the opponent's cleats uh, impacting squarely with their anterior maxilla. Uh, the, this resulted in a loss of permanent teeth seven through 11, and even more devastating, the loss of her anterior maxillary bone. Uh, due to the traumatic loss of teeth and bone, her maxilla was retronathic, sort of a pseudo class three skeletal relationship. With insufficient horizontal and vertical bone and no implants, the best I could offer her at that point was a removable partial denture. Okay, so, so she lost his teeth uh, during an accident. She was in the transitional restoration mm -hmm. that uh, kind of held her, and that was in 2001. So in 2002, um, I think she was uh, 15 years old at that point? 16. 16. Yeah. Obviously, she had a, um, a maxillary deficiency, and we saw that in the initial photo. So she underwent a, a corrective uh, jaw surgery, orthognathic procedure in 2002, and we can see the x-ray with uh, the, the plates and screws. Uh, this was a Lefort 1 osteotomy that was done to try to correct and, and uh, the deficiency or the discrepancy at that point. Yes, yes. There right. was, there was, at, the, at that point, it was old school. Um, there, were, there, was, there was really no such thing as prosthetically driven placement of implants, just where the available bone was. And uh, lack of an adequate vestibule, so the patient really had a very difficult time with her hygiene, which is key to success in these cases. It's right. counterintuitive. And uh, so it, we, we did the best that we could um, if I had, had to do this case over again, knowing what I know now, I would have recommended less implants and more evenly spaced. So that kind of brings us to th 2003, a year after the orthognathic procedure. A patient did go through placement of these implants. And like you said, um, I think the strategy uh, of the treatment at that point was you know, providing the implants with the available bone that she had. Of course, there was a significant amount of deficiency already from the traumatic ac uh, from a tra traumatic accident that she had, and we can appreciate from this uh, Panorex uh, the the platform or the level of the implants, which is quite epical, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, you know, perhaps adequate to support the implants at the time. Uh, but as, uh, as we'll dial much later, uh, it, it did become an issue at some point. And this was 2014, um, that uh, the situation that we discussed earlier, uh, these restorations had been in place and had served her uh, for years. about 10 years yeah. uh, before she became more symptomatic with loss of tissue and bone. Yes. I think, I think the, the uh, critical thing, and I think if we could look at this x-ray that we showed initially, uh, the, a few things that came to mind right away, and I, I know you and I talked about this mm -hmm. uh, during our diagnostic and consultation phase, was, you know, the number of implants, of course, yeah. Um, the question is, could she have done with less number of implants? Um, possibly, um, I think, uh, during those days uh, yes. before we had a better idea of the, the, the biology of adjacent implants in the anterior area, uh, it was practiced quite often that you put uh, one implant per tooth, and that was certainly okay. But I think the thing that really kind of comes out from, the, from this x-ray is the long restoration abutment compared to the implant level. And that's mainly because the, 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 they were play, uh, placed very epically where the available bone was. Uh, so I would imagine that probably access for hygiene probably was difficult, uh, yeah. not only for her, but also... For you as a practitioner, a hygienist, um, can you can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the um, she really did the best that she could with her hygiene. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, pulling one's lip out to getting access to where the uh, implant crown junction is is really physically impossible for an average patient. She really did the best she could. We used uh, water picks and and uh, the various types of hygiene type of, uh, uh, of mm -hmm. tricks that we have. Uh, and, uh, but really, it wasn't adequate. When you don't have an adequate vestibule, you can't keep it clean. 
Um, and I think the one, the one thing we had going for us, the reason I believe that it lasted uh, 10 years, which I think is you know, fairly good success for this kind of case at that time, was that she did have a, a minimal overbite over jet. So yeah. she really wasn't uh, torquing those uh, adverse axial incline inclined uh, implants all that much. So, um, so at this point, we were faced with uh, existing implants, peri-implantitis, uh, evidence of uh, advanced loss of bone and soft tissue around the implants. And pain. Uh, and, of course, symptomatic. Yes. So, so when it came to considering our treatment options, uh, it was really two options. One is to try to maintain her as best as possible and monitor and perhaps uh, debride, uh, clean, uh, but that was not really effective uh, uh, as it was attempted. So the only other option, of course, was to remove the implants. Uh, as, as, you know, as, as we had talked about before in, in, other, uh, in other meetings, uh, attempt to try to graft around these implants to try to regenerate the bone and soft tissue is highly unpredictable, simply doesn't work. Uh, especially once you have uh, loss of bone and exposure of the implant surface. So, this, so really maintenance of these implants was not really uh, a realistic option for us. Yeah, we should really bring, uh, make a point here that um, after practicing 40 plus years, um, I've learned that you have to know your patient before embarking on a, a case like this that becomes a journey. Um, uh, the cases for an average patient like this um, is perhaps uh, not going to work for, out very well. Mm -hmm. uh, this patient had uh, the ideal characteristics um, uh, to endure a complex implant reconstruction case, and I call the three T's. Uh, she was tolerant, she was tough, and she was tenacious. And without these mm -hmm. traits, most patients should be not should be advised not to take this treatment pathway at all. Right. Right. Uh, right. So let's uh, talk about what we did. Uh, really, the first step uh, was to remove these ailing and failing implants. There was really no other option. Uh, so here, um, uh, just a incision. Uh, the implants actually were not that difficult to remove. They were uh, mainly being held by the epical, um, maybe uh, five to ten percent That's of the bad. implant in bone. So they did not really require much uh, intervention. And mostly were uh, mobilized and removed. At this point, really, all we did was cleanse and place some uh, place some uh, uh, plate-rich fibrin membranes just for maturation of tissue and close. Obviously, this is not a great stage to do any bone grafting. The, the quality of the soft tissue is poor, uh, and um, it's best to really allow biology and to take its course, get some healing and then look at options down the line. So she comes back three months later. Uh, we waited three months for the soft tissue to heal and mature, and um, she came back for a follow-up, and this is the kind of defect that we have now, which we anticipated. Yes. This, is, this was not a surprise. Uh, we knew that there was gonna be some remodeling uh, based on uh, where the level of the bone was, but it's really, Dramatic. This is a really dramatic presentation of a defect. When we, when we look at this case, especially in the side view, one can appreciate the, the uh, vertical and horizontal deficiency of maxillary bone. How could you possibly fix this case up uh, and, 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 and without uh, advanced um, type of surgical intervention to create uh, an ideal situation to place uh, additional implants? Yeah, look at the, the, the cone beam CT scan. The, the basal bone is pretty much almost up to the nasal floor. Uh, teeth number 6 and 12 uh, were also compromised with uh, minimal bone around them. Um, so we have very clear evidence of a three-dimensional defect on the, on the cone beam CT scan. Uh, when you look at the cross-section on the cone beam CT scan, you can appreciate the compromised alveolar bo bone around number six and number 12. But look at the, the, the differential height, distance from the lower incisor to where the ridge is. Dramatic. This is quite, uh, quite deficient. This is probably mm -hmm. one of the more uh, uh, severely deficient, three-dimensionally deficient uh, defects that I've seen. So, so when we look at the classification of this kind of defect, because you know, as we start to think about treatment options and what type of grafting options that we have to restore this defect in this uh, young individual who has many more years of life ahead of her and she would like to 
eat, she likes to smile, she likes to live her life. So uh, certainly a, a partial denture or a flipper is not going to be a very uh, good, good, good mm -hmm. option for her. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the classification, we certainly have a, uh, a combined horizontal and vertical, uh, uh, which is uh, um, uh, great. Uh, it's quite on the severe side. And I think the critical uh, issue is that this defect is outside of the envelope. Outside of the envelope means that it's, uh, it's the, 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 the actual deficiency is outside of the, uh, the ridge that she has. And this provides us with some uh, uh, options in terms of how to manage this. Um, so, uh, uh, one of the huge challenges in managing these three-dimensional defects is not so much the bone graft itself. The bone graft procedures are available to be able to do horizontal, vertical uh, augmentations. But really, the major challenge is soft tissue. Hmm. Uh, and so, when we look at the presentation of her at this point, we are faced with a couple of um, challenges. Number one, we have uh, deficient soft tissue. We have a lot of scarring from previous procedures. Um, we can see the uh, scar tissue from not only probably her Lefort 1 or orthognathic procedures, but also the most recent explantation. Uh, the level of the intercepal bone in number 6 and 12 is compromised uh, with bone loss. Luckily, there is a thick soft tissue mm -hmm. that's present. So we do have a thick tissue biotype uh, available. Uh, number six uh, had buccal inclination, uh, loss of bone. A short root too. And a short root. Yes. And for the most part, the amount of deficiency that we had to deal with. So, so as I said, really the challenge in vertical augmentation and any kind of ridge defect like this is really the soft tissue is the limiting step. An additional challenge I think you should uh, mention to the, uh, the members is that uh, when patients have scar tissue and you're, and you're trying to get success, uh, it compromises the vascularity and perfusion of the tissues you're trying to nourish. Absolutely, right. absolutely. So we thought about, you know, how, how, what are the uh, options in terms of bone grafting? Uh, since soft tissue is really the main challenge here, um, there are really two ways that i found where we can redevelop the soft tissue quality and quantity to ultimately be able to support the bone graft that's done. And one is osteogenesis distraction, uh, a technique where we can actually distract the bone, but more importantly, distract the soft tissue. The other option that we chose here uh, in her first phase of this treatment was doing uh, a what's called an interpositional bone graft. Just to explain this a little bit more, the idea behind this technique is that we are not creating an incision at the alveolar crest, not at the ridge itself. Mm -hmm. It's deep in the vestibule where we can do a, um, an osteotomy, essentially down graft the remaining part of the maxilla, the premaxilla, mm -hmm. and place an interpositional bone graft to, uh, to hold it in place. So for this, um, once the osteotomy was done, it was immediately positioned more inferiorly, allowing that tissue to stretch. It's much easier to close the mucosal tissue over this than it is the creatinine gingiva. We did uh, perform uh, uh, bone harvesting from the iliac crest to be hospital, able right? to actually, yeah, this was under general anesthesia mm -hmm. in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we were able to down, down uh, position or inferiorly reposition the maxilla and place the iliac block bone graft as an interpositional to stabilize it. And then some plates and screws to really provide rigid fixation. And here is the x-ray after we can see right away the amount of the vertical augmentation that we were able to achieve not only from a bone standpoint and we can see the dramatic change in the vertical augmentation with one surgery but i think more importantly we were able to stretch the tissue uh, and because of the fact that this incision was in the vestibule we were not concerned about incision uh, breakdown uh, which is really the main concern. Uh, if this was an onlay bone graft uh, for vertical augmentation, there would be very difficult, if not impossible, to close over the bone with that amount of soft tissue. And the last thing we need at this point is a slough, right. tissue slough. 
So, um, so incredibly, uh, she healed well, uh, responded quite nicely, and, and we can see that in six months, we have additional bone, but more importantly, we have now more soft tissue to work with. So during this time, uh, she was uh, using the transitional prosthesis. Yes. Uh, we provided, I think, with an Essex appliance, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of critical. We've talked about this in, in again, previous meetings about the, the, the really a critical aspect of the transitional prosthesis. These patients are going through months and months of waiting. This is in the aesthetic zone. So use of a, a flipper or denture would really compromise the, the, the soft tissue and the bone. So we always advocate a non-tissue bearing um, transitional. So Essex Appliance has been a very inexpensive um, and easy solution to be able to provide patients with a transitional tooth while sparing the, uh, uh, the tissue. And it can be ingested yeah. on, the, on the tissue side as the surgeries progress to make sure there's no pressure on the tissues exactly. as they heal. Exactly. So here we are at the developed uh, additional uh, soft tissue, which is really the uh, primary uh, goal. But we were still deficient. <laughs> we did not have enough bone still vertically and more importantly horizontally to be able to place the implants. And we knew that. Uh, we, we had planned on doing this on a two-stage augmentation. Mm -hmm. The first stage to get as much vertical as possible, establish our soft tissue. So for the second stage, of course, there are many different options of how we can uh, achieve additional uh, horizontal and vertical bone, mainly using various kind of um, GBR techniques, uh, different materials, different membranes. Uh, there's certainly several techniques that can be used. Uh, but we decided to uh, use um, time mesh as our modality for the GBR technique. And we also decided to take advantage of every possible source of biology materials uh, known to mankind <laughs> to try to optimize this no, no augmentation. No stone unturned. No stone unturned. <laughs> so time mesh using with uh, using autogenous bone, allogenic bone, PRF, and using the RH BMP2, which is a highly highly inductive material with bone morphogenic protein to try to optimize our bone um, augmentation. So here we are at the stage where we use the time mesh, we uh, use the particulate bone graft mixed with this RHBMP2, fixated, we place some uh, PRF membranes, and now because we had the soft tissue, we were able to close rather uh, readily and, and, and successfully uh, with a primary closure and more, most importantly, a tensionless closure. Mm -hmm. This kind of shows a little bit about the, the, the technique here uh, of how we do this, just so that we can kind of uh, get to. So this is, you can tell here from the video, the amount of the vertical augmentation. This is after the interpositional bone graft and the amount of augmentation that we were able to achieve from the first phase. Uh, these plates and screws are removed at that stage. And here is the, the mesh that's been adapted. Ultimately, it's important to be able to have a tensionless closure. So we have to do some release of the soft tissue to be able to uh, drape over the, uh, the new GBR. Probably the most important part of this procedure is the soft tissue release. The mesh adapted and fixated with the bone graft inside and some micro screws to hold the mesh in place. One of the advantages of a, of a um, non-resorbable membrane, particularly in mesh, is that it, f it, it holds its form. Mm -hmm. uh, the dimension of the membrane is rigid where it really creates the space that we're trying to hold for the bone augmentation. You can customize the shape of your ridge. Exactly. Yeah. Of course, the using of a mesh uh, for this kind of purpose, the, the, it is also risky because one of the most common complications exposure. can be exposure of the mesh. And once the mesh becomes exposed, the bone graft will not survive. So mm -hmm. this is 
not a low risk procedure by any means, but certainly when it works, it really does provide an amazing um, result in bone, both bone quality and quantity. Yeah, primary closure exactly. is key here. So here is uh, just a closure to really to provide us the ability to close over this uh, GBR and multiple layers, um, muscle layers, uh, closure, and ultimately closure of the incision in a tensionless fashion, which is really the critical point. All right, so here's the cone beam CT scan afterward showing the mesh in place. And now we can kind of see that we are essentially restored the alveolar ridge back to its original position or where it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have adequate height and look at the amount of width. We certainly uh, were able to successfully regenerate uh, the um, deficiency of the bone in, in both uh, di uh, dimensions. Incredible. And now here we are. Um, soft tissue stable, the ridge restored. I might argue that we actually overbuilt it. You can actually see that there is uh, almost uh, inadequate inter-arch space. Good problem to have. <laughs> Good problem to have. <laughs> um, and of course, you also note that uh, teeth number 6 and 12 were extracted yes. at the first stage uh, and so that we can take advantage of the more ideally positioned interceptal bone of those posterior teeth. Mm -hmm. However. Okay. So <laughs> here we are. Uh, certainly now we have enough bone, enough tissue to be able to place the implant. Look at the before, look at the after, and I would say that was uh, quite successful. So this was a time that we decided to look at some implant options. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly had enough bone to be able to place the implant. So uh, can you describe what we did in the next uh, stage? Well, we tried to figure out, um, uh, we wanted to make, this, uh, make sure this case was, planning was prosthetically driven. So uh, we used uh, scanning technology. Uh, we, placed, uh, uh, we placed teeth where the ideal position where we wanted them to be. And then we, we were brainstorming with the laboratory. How can we achieve this prosthetic goal? Uh, is the bone in the right place for us to put implants to achieve this goal? And the answer at this point was no, it was not. Yeah, I think this was a critical point because without occlusion, uh, we really don't have any ideas. So really the first thing we did was to do a digital wax up and to establish the occlusion, the aesthetics. And here's the occlusion that we were able to achieve. But what was interesting is that when you and I took this digital wax up and did the initial implant planning, right away we noticed that there was a fairly significant cantilever of the restoration in relation to the position of the implant. Which would have been a repeat of the original problem or the original prosthetics that we put in. Not as severe, but certainly along the same lines. Which, which kind of not surprising because the patient was in class three. Uh, yes. If you look at the cephalometric uh, x-ray here, we can appreciate that you know, she is in a class three position. So in order to make up the uh, distance, uh, you'd have to really kind of create a cantilever shelf from the abutment to a restoration. Of course, the other option would be to put her in a um, class three uh, dental occlusion. Mm -hmm but not certainly not an ideal from an aesthetic standpoint and certainly a function. Mm -hmm. So here's the class three skeletal relationship uh, that was very quite evident once we did the digital workup. So we discussed really the options with her uh, and, and we knew that there were only two options. Either we put the implants where we can and the best we could have done was a class three occlusion with teeth in the reverse overjet uh, or we would have to correct the skeletal discrepancy. Uh, so we really talked to her about these options and she wanted to have as normal of a smile and relationship as possible. She's come so far and uh, she wanted to explore the options of being able to do this um, as, with, a, with a normal appearance and normal occlusion. And she was thinking of getting married. 
-hmm. and uh, starting her life. And she lived out of town at this point in Pittsburgh, I believe. Uh, and so um, we had her traveling uh, to have these procedures done to, your, to our mutual offices. Yeah. It wasn't so easy. Yeah. So we proposed uh, a um, orthognathic procedure, an advancement, mm -hmm. Lefort 1 osteotomy. Uh, since her mandible was in relatively good position, it was really mostly the maxilla that was in retro position. So if we could advance this, it would put us in a more ideal uh, position. So the next step uh, for the treatment was the Lefort 1 maxillary advancement to try to uh, create a no more normal relationship. Went through orthodontic treatment. Uh, Dr. Bailey joined in the team at that point. Uh, she helped to level and align the lower arch um, and also the posterior occlusion in preparation for the orthognathic procedure. Uh, the orthognathic procedure was really a simple repositioning of the maxilla anteriorly uh, by about um, um, seven millimeters, seven yes. or eight millimeters. I remember that, yeah. yes. Uh, so maxilla was advanced, rigid fixation, and closed. And here is the patient after the orthognathic procedure. And this is what's interesting um, in terms of comparison from where we started to the post orthognathic position. I think we can see that now we have the maxilla definitely in a more class one relationship compared to where we started. Which will enhance the longevity of the, uh, of the prosthesis implant, retain prosthesis eventually. Well, yes. yeah, definitely a more normal implant, uh, implant and, and restoration yes. alignment. Um, so in order to get to the next phase, we had to, uh, or, or at least the implant placement, we had to remove the mesh and prepare for the, the tissue and the implants. So at this stage, this is about a year after the mesh GBR technique, uh, where uh, we simply um, went through the same um, crystal incision, removed the mesh, the fixation screws are removed, and the mesh is removed, and we had a fairly good quality of bone uh, to use for the implants. At this stage, we simply closed just to allow the soft tissue to heal. We were not ready for the implant at this point yet mm -hmm. because we wanted to really kind of do the workup um, once the tissue was out. But the problem that we had uh, was after bone grafting, and this is not unusual that we see this after advanced bone grafting, um, that we lose vestibule and we lose keratinized gingiva. She had a very thin zone of it to begin with. So at some point, we have to think about vestibuloplasty and gingival graft. Now, this, this can be done either before the implant placement or it can be done after the implant placement. There's certainly both options are possible. In this case, uh, we uh, wanted to actually allow a little bit more time for uh, the, the bone to mature even mm -hmm. longer, so we were not in a rush to put an implant. We figured that we'll go ahead and uh, do the vestibular plasty and soft tissue mm -hmm. revision at this stage, and then do the implants in the second stage. So here we can see the position of the mucogingival junction uh, and all the mucosal uh, tissue uh, buckle to that. So for this, uh, a, a technique that uh, we use quite often is using a superperiosteal dissection uh, to partial elevate. It's a partial thickness, Dissection. exactly. Mm -hmm. And we dissect it in order to uh, reposition the uh, gingival margin or the creatinine gingival more epically. We secure it in place and a lot of loose uh, tissue. And here uh, the, we basically obtain an autogenous tissue from the palate. This is a thin strip of gingival tissue, partial thickness. And the idea behind this technique, which is known as the gingival strip technique, is to position it in the epical aspect and we leave the rest of the recipient site exposed and just cover it with some mucograft. Uh, 
And the idea behind this technique is that we have um, cells from the palatal side, creatinized tissue to granulating from the palatal side, and the gingival graft from the apical aspect, uh, providing the, the cells for the granulation to achieve um, more creatinized gingiva. So essentially we're holding um, the mucograft in position as a, as a dressing, and we allow this to uh, time to mature. And here we are in about six weeks. We're starting to get pink tissue. We're starting to get um, some in increased zone of creatinized gingiva. And the mucogingival junction now is more appropriately repositioned in the vestibule. Yeah, more favorable. Now, one of the challenges in her case was um, from severe lack of vestibule, there was only so much that you can sort of reposition superiorly uh, but we managed to get as much as possible before the implant. So this brings us to the next phase um, of implant therapy. We go through the same exercise. So we established uh, our occlusion, um, digital wax up, and we had planned for replacement of six teeth, number six to 11. Mm -hmm. Now she has two premolars missing. Yes. Um, so her arch size was actually wider mm -hmm. than normal. the normal yes. canine to canine space, but it was really um, uh, not possible to achieve premolar placement into this arch. So uh, wider, larger arch than a two canine Distance. Yeah, without digital scanning, yeah. which we, we had at this point, which I did not have that advantage back in 2003 or four, this enhances the patient's uh, chance of success, which is our goal. So, yeah. And also one of the things that she uh, wanted and she asked is whether or not it's possible to do a single restorations, single yes. implant restorations on each tooth. Now, normally uh, we like to stagger the implants in the anterior zone, but because of the size of the arch, and the distance between the implants, um, it was certainly a safer environment to do implants individually. Uh, usually if we have at least three to four millimeters of distance between the implants, it meets the criteria based on the evidence that we know. And we had even more in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did plan it for um, individual implants. And because we had the advantage of, of, of digital um, scans and planning, we, we were, our goal was to, get, to make this a screw retained type of zirconia implant restoration. Exactly. So these are just standard um, uh, four millimeter implants. Um, the lateral incisor was a narrow, uh, narrow platform. Mm -hmm. Implants placed, healing abutments there, scan bodies, implants were scanned mm -hmm. in order to um, begin the design and fabrication of the transitional restoration. And that's the part that you took over. One of at many. That point. One, One of many. many. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we let the tissues heal, and while the um, incision is healing, the, the, the transitional restoration, which is a fixed, screw-retained, implant-supported PMMA, PMMA yes. was fabricated. Uh, this was placed approximately how long after the implants? I think we, um, I, well, I think we tried to do this um, well, very soon afterwards. Yeah, within yeah. A few I think it was uh, really once, it was about three weeks yes. later, while, while the tissue was still healing, the healing abutments were removed. I mean, this is a great time to be able to place the, the provisional restoration to start to design the soft tissue. Mm -hmm. And also to provide her some sense of stability, occlusion, aesthetics. Uh, so she was ecstatic at that point to be yes. able to have this. Yes, her toughness, such a long her, time. her toughness and tenacity was being tested for sure. Yeah, indeed. Incidentally, one of the implants uh, uh, had a fibrous re uh, union uh, at um, the later time it did not survive. Right. So um, we had five implants that had adequate reverse torque and, and healing and very stable. So implant number nine did not survive. Uh, that did not bother us greatly uh, because we still had adequate uh, implants for 
the restoration. We just couldn't go to a single unit on each one, but that was the only uh, setback that we had in this case. And the only change was for uh, units eight and 10, the abutments, we had to use multi-unit abutments because we had to make, they weren't parallel to each other. Exactly. So we let the, um, the provisional uh, in function um, and we allowed the tissue maturation and she had this uh, transitional for some time. Oh yes, but it was months. I think at least uh, four months. Yes. Uh, this was a time that I think she had several visits with you for revisions, uh, for addition of or changes in the contour of the provisional restoration? Yes, with PMMA restorations, um, uh, you'd have used a like type of acrylic to add, uh, to fill in the deficient uh, deficiencies within the uh, PMMA to uh, mm -hmm. basically uh, train the tissue how you want it to be in the final. Okay. Um, and we just allowed the soft tissue to heal. And note, note in the, those in these um, images that I made sure that they were out of occlusion, because we certainly didn't want to have any kind of protrusive trauma uh, to the uh, re to the newly um, seated restorations and implants. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a, a very important point because, you know, even though we had um, good diameter and length of implants, uh, but we still have what we have to believe is a D three D four bone from the from the graft. So. Uh, so I think being on the cautionary side during that loading period, I think it's a great idea. We just have to take it slowly each, and, each, and, and, uh, and it certainly uh, worked out in her case. Yeah, each judgment that we make along the way is critical and you basically learn how the patient's going to heal and what they can tolerate as you go. Um, we, you know the guidelines, but do the guidelines fit this, the parameters this patient needs? So um, also she had a very low lip line, which, which aesthetically uh, Saved us. was, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was certainly favorable, yes. but nevertheless, I think we strive to, to optimize in the appearance of the, um, of the gingival tissue. Um, the teeth themselves is one side of the story, but the soft tissue really is a critical factor in the uh, ultimately our aesthetic result. All right, so then we had to work on occlusion and work on soft tissue. This is really the, um, the putting the final touches uh, on this treatment. Um, you went through a second provisional. So yes. you had to um, revise and create a whole new provisional. Um, and tell me about that a little bit. Well, it, it, yes, we did a second provisional, more aesthetic, longer uh, crowns, obviously. Um, we wanted to kind of train the soft tissue. It's our second provisional. But then if you recall, I was kind of pushing you, which is kind of the theme yeah. that we have as, a, as my brother and I uh, discuss these cases at all hours. And uh, I said, let's try to do another vestibuloplasty. Let's try, because we really don't have an adequate vestibule. And my my memory of back in 2003, 2004, when we, we actually had no vestibule and she couldn't clean it, I just saw a failure in, in waiting and that we wanted to avoid. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's interesting because uh, there is definitely some relapse in severe cases of, um, severe cases like this where, yes, we can get the keratinized gingiva, uh, but the, the muscle attachment uh, it kind of creeps down and it, there is some relapse of the, the vestibule depth. Again, uh, here is the x-ray at that point. So while we were planning on this second set of provisional restorations, that was another opportunity to attempt to achieve, again, improve the quality and quantity of soft tissue. If there's one thing that we've learned and this has been well published is um, the thickness of the soft tissue is very much protective of the underlying bone and implants, as well as certainly the, the aesthetic outcome of the case. Just as important. Actually. So just another, uh, another uh, opportunity to be able to do the soft tissue. Here again, with the same technique, doing a, a split thickness uh, flap to reposition uh, the margin of the tissue more epically. And in this case, we went with a full thickness, complete coverage of the defect uh, due to the size of the area, uh, obtaining um, split thickness, gingival graft from the palate from both sides, 
and both sides were uh, grafted. This was allowed to mature for another three months and we can start to see the change in the quality of the tissue, mm -hmm. uh, thicker, keratinized, and certainly um, kind of bring in a sense of papilla formation and better transition from the restoration. It was incredible, it was a transformation at yeah. that point. And this is uh, about um, really about uh, three months, mm -hmm. about two and a half, three months after the grafting. So we kept it in provisional for some time, and this shows the transformation of the, the vestibule and the soft tissue. Uh, she seemed to be stable. Her vertical dimension was comfortable for her. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't have to change the vertical dimension on her, I don't think. No, that, not that much at all. Right? There were a couple of uh, posterior teeth that had restorations that had broken down through all the mm -hmm. uh, many years that, we, that she uh, had to go through this treatment. So we basically spent a lot of time uh, putting a couple of um, positive uh, centric stops with some well-fitting crowns in her posterior teeth. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, just a couple, two, two on each side. Yeah, she had enough uh, posterior stop to be able to support her vertical dimension yeah. throughout. Which is critical. Yeah. So we just allowed the soft tissue to mature, to heal, and eventually um, uh, final impressions and final restoration. Now this is her uh, final restoration here at this point. Yes, it is. Um, and. Tell me about your choice of materials and occlusion, and what, 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 what were some of your considerations? I think that those of us that go back many, many years um, can appreciate the fact that uh, uh, what we what we what we we take for granted that uh, zirconia-based uh, prosthetics has been around for you know ten or twenty years. That is not the case. Mm -hmm. the, the truth is, it's about 2015-16. Um, so, uh, but it's amazing how quickly this has become the norm. Uh, so this is a full ceramic zirconia yes. restoration. It's a yes. monolithic. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's a monolithic yeah. Uh, uh, zirconia. Yeah, this is done by uh, Lintec Dental Lab. Okay. Um, a, a, just excellent, excellent um, uh, treatment. She did very, very well. Uh, uh, for these kind of cases, I also recommend the patient uh, wear um, uh, a night guard. Uh, if you wear an upper night guard, a, a typical, mm -hmm. uh, think about it. When a patient comes downward and forward in anterior lateral bruxism, what's going to wind up happening is th they're going to traumatize the, uh, the, the uh, maxillary anterior prosthetics. They're physically going to move them. So in these kind of cases, I like a modified gelve appliance that covers the uh, clusal aspect of the patient's posterior teeth. Sometimes we extend it to the canine. Mm -hmm. We definitely extend the acrylic onto the lingual, uh, lingual aspect of the lower anterior teeth, but do not cover the incisal edge of the anterior teeth because that would be counterproductive with too much force on the upper uh, anterior bridge work. Um, and uh, then we make sure that when the patient comes in protrusive that they clear completely, that those lower anterior teeth and nor the appliance touches those upper anterior teeth. Right. Um, and we also, get, another trick is, you have to make sure that the most posterior uh, opposing tooth does not contact the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the new modified gelb or else it'll cause intrusion of that tooth. So you want a very light contact in the most posterior tooth. And, uh, and she's done very, very well. And, um, and the case continues, she continues to thrive. She's had her first child um, and uh, she is just a happy camper. So here is uh, five years later. Um, we actually saw her for a follow-up uh, recently. Um, and, you know, bone and implants are, are stable. Her restoration is stable. The soft tissue is stable. The only area that uh, I noted a little change in tooth number 10, there was some uh, grayish hue. Um, and uh, even though the soft tissue is thick, I think we had a little bit of a um, uh, remodeling of the tissue there. Yeah, they, uh, they, they, there's well, no pocket. It's no, healthy, healthy and it's comfortable. Yeah, but uh, but but that's the only area of, of change that we noticed. When you think that you're done with the case like this, you're really never done. Yeah, you basically marry the patient's married you. You're married to the patient in a, in a positive way, in a good uh, way because we've had we've had very very good success in this situation. The uh, maxillary anterior bridge did loosen. The uh, screws backed out. Not a problem. It's screw retained. I was able to remove the composite. 
um, uh, and then I reshaped the uh, the uh, zirconia around the uh, around the abutment. Uh, and even though a little bit of metal was showing there because of her uh, low uh, lip line, um, it, it didn't bother the case whatsoever. I just screwed it back in. Contacts were there. Occlusion was fine, and uh, puts a composite back where it was before in the lingual aspect of the mm -hmm. screw channels, and she was just fine. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, also the fact that the restorations are splinted across arch yes. uh, really adds uh, stability to the restoration of the implants, especially in her occlusion and her musculature, which is really quite strong. Very. Uh, very strong. Uh, and uh, that become a risk factor in some patients because of the enormous amount of occlusal load that they can put on the restoration like this. So I think the fact that we have this splinted cross arch and not, don't have single uh, restorations, uh, I think worked out to our advantage. Uh, and, and I think we're more comfortable with that. I think it's very important as a, uh, as a restorative dentist to never let that thought go into your mind that this doesn't matter, that doesn't matter. Every little thing must, must be uh, attained to every little detail, and then you wind up with a very positive outcome. Great. So here's the five years, and again, the, the really the dr dramatic uh, change from where we started uh, to where uh, we ended. I think, you know, we, uh, I, I think, Mitch, you, you and I were talking about, you know, certainly a success story in this case, and, and um, we were talking on telephone, and I said, look, uh, we did the best we could as clinicians, certainly materials, techniques, and you know, following uh, evidence-based dentistry and, 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 and all that is, is great. But I think it's important to acknowledge the real key important factor in the success of a case like this, and that's the patient. Oh yes. So I think you know, one thing that I, uh, that I take, took away from this treatment was um, this patient was always positive, excited, happy, compliant, mm -hmm. uh, and really was someone who was on board. She was in the game and she cared about it. And, and I think that her healing physiology, how she responded to many procedures, which um, I would consider to be some of them high risk procedures in, in, in any hands, uh, and she responded well to those. So I think, um, I think we have to always acknowledge that what the patient provides us with their physiology, their health, and their emotional state really has a lot to do with the success of a case as well. It does. So, uh, it really does. I so, mean, so, you know, so we don't deserve all the credit. I think actually, actually, she deserves most of the credit than you and I. <laughs> tenacious, tough. Right. That's a that's a quality you need in these patients. Patient selection to go through this. Whenever there was a complication, I remember with this patient, she seemed to take it in stride, and she said, "Okay, well, let's take care of it." Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mop, uh, what is your uh, recommendations on the maintenance schedule for uh, someone like her? What the, is your strategy? These patients um, should be seen uh, uh, for high dental hygiene visits once every uh, four months minimum, and not twice a year, and if possible, every three months. If we skip and go to a four month cycle, that's okay too, but certainly much more than, uh, uh, than you would with the average case. But again, she's doing very, very well with her home care. She wears her night guard. Um, and so I'm very proud of her because she's really, uh, uh, I've seen her mature from this young girl basically at age 15 to a woman who, uh, who's a guy, got married, she's a wife now, she's a mother, mm -hmm. and she takes everything in stride. She's really a, a role model for all, that all patients should follow, uh, all of us should follow actually when things right. come up in life. We'll continue to update our colleagues on, on the outcome of this patient and also before years coming because, because I think one of the important things uh, for us to learn from is the longevity of a treatment like this. Um, and one really concerning area is the stability of the grafted bone, stability of the soft tissue, and its maintenance over time. So, so far over five years, it has shown to be stable and quite favorable. But I think when we look at these cases from 10 years to 15 years, uh, there's certainly some changes that are anticipated, but we can also expect 
a, a level of stability. As long as her health is okay, as long as she's maintaining her home hygiene, as long as um, uh, receiving professional maintenance. And I think what you mentioned earlier about uh, um, have to constantly monitor, you have to check, you have to you know, catch little things before they become bigger issues. Um, and, and that's really a critical area for longevity of, of, uh, of these cases and long-term success. Yeah, I think that yeah. uh, as we learned and re uh, reading uh, with Dental XP and our colleagues, the Salamas brothers, I think that, um, uh, which it's humbling uh, for me, and it's humbling for me to work with you because I think that your, your skill is so far above and beyond um, um, anyone I've ever seen. And uh, it's a privilege to work with you, Hamid. I really mean that from Thank the bottom of my heart. Much. And, um, and I, I really would uh, like to invite all members to uh, bring your cases to Hamid because he will teach you. It's really basically like living a CE course when you do a case with Hamid. He'll teach you, you'll learn, and you'll grow, as I did. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise for me, uh, to work with people of, uh, like yourself that are so deeply engaged in the well-being of your patients and um, really giving 150% uh, and, and everything that you do really makes a difference. I think that teamwork is, is magical. It's uh, the, the pillar of our success is this multidisciplinary team approach, always thinking, always collaborating, and challenging each other to do better. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being our thank guest. You. Thank you for working with me uh, on uh, this patient's uh, treatment. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you again in okay. a future program. Absolutely. All Thank right. you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone joining. Look for the recorded version of uh, this program, which will be on our website on fishawdentalforum.com. And we look forward to seeing you next month for another complex case discussion series. Thank you again. Ciao. Okay. Thank Bye you. now.